business and politics show. We'd like to welcome Go Local regular Jennifer Lawless, going to be starting up at UVA in the fall. Jennifer, thanks for joining us. Of course. Well, you can give us a little bit of a weather tidbit. Apparently, it's pouring rain down inside the Beltway as we speak. It is. It's raining. It's thundering. I think it pretty much reflects both Democrats and Republicans' moods today. So it's pretty perfectly timed. Is, is, it, is it apocalyptic in D.C.? I mean, let, let's just start there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, could you have envisioned, uh, as, you, as, as folks anticipated this meeting between President Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, that this would be the outcome? No, I mean, I don't think anybody could have expected it to go this poorly. And in fact, his own staff and the people in the Trump administration were stunned as well, not only because they had prepared him to make sure that he was seen as strong against Vladimir Putin, but because they certainly had no inkling that he would ultimately side with Putin over U.S. intelligence agents, right? Like that was something that probably was not even discussed in the preliminary uh, briefings just because it's so foreign, no pun intended, to think that that's what a U.S. president would do. And, you know, so I think it left a lot of people scratching their heads. And, you know, if we believe today's reporting, Donald Trump left that press conference thinking that he did a great job. And it wasn't until he was on Air Force One and route back to Washington that he started to realize that Democrats and Republicans alike had a different impression. So as you talk about the president getting the sense of the reaction to this meeting, do we expect to hear anything from the White House? It seems like there's been limited communications today, but do we see a response to his own summit? Well, last night they sent out talking points to key reporters and to Republicans who are running for re-election this cycle and to candidates who might be asked questions. And the talking points were somewhat bizarre. CNN read them out loud, and they were just sort of silly because they completely refuted what most people had actually seen either in watching the press conference or in watching reporting from the press conference, right? So among the many talking points was the White House trying to get out this idea that Donald Trump supports U.S. intelligence agencies and he prioritizes their information and intelligence above and beyond that of Putin and his Russian counterparts. And so that's just completely antithetical to what was stated, but it's clearly important to the White House not the president, but the White House and his supporters to, you know, mitigate a lot of the damage that was done yesterday. And, and how big was it for him to make those statements about the intelligence community here in the country and as it pertains to the elections? And as we've seen, you know, basically taking Putin's side over his, his own intelligence community. I think it was really important for a couple of reasons. The first is it wasn't only that he said he was unsure about U.S. intelligence. It was when push came to shove, he chose Putin's word over U.S. intelligence. And that has led people on both sides of the aisle to say that his behavior actually met the legal standard of what is treasonous, right? The second reason that this is really important is because the logic that he used and the rhetoric that he employed looked strikingly similar to what he did in Charlottesville, where at that time a year ago, you know, he basically said that people fighting neo-Nazis and neo-Nazis were equally to blame for the chaos in Charlottesville. Similarly, both the United States and Russia were equally to blame for Russian interference in U.S. elections if there had been any. And it's striking because that messaging was very, very unsuccessful last summer. To employ that same kind of messaging again now over an issue that is far more dangerous. I mean, this is not to say that you know, a race riot and anti-Semitism in Charlottesville is not important. It's awful and it's disgusting. But nuclear war is a little bit broader in terms of its consequences. And to Donald Trump, it doesn't seem like there's really any distinction and there's certainly no learning. And so let's talk a little bit about that and what folks have been saying perhaps were the president's motivations to be so placating uh, to Putin. A couple pertain to potentially his business interest in Russia. And then there's always the one that hangs around. What does Russia have on him? What's, what's the talk there? 
I, so the talk from Democrats on the Senate Intelligence Committee and people who have had access to a lot of this information is the general sense that, yeah, Russia has something on Trump. And Russia has had information on Trump from the time that he first started doing business there, you know, 30 years ago. The fact that Putin said, no, we didn't really care, he was nothing to us before he was president, flies in the face of both what Trump and Putin have said in the past about Trump's financial dealings with Russia. Republicans are more inclined to back off of that kind of logic because acknowledging that would suggest that there is a possibility of collusion or that there are relationships that they've spent the last 18 months saying don't exist. But I think they, too, realize that this seems very strange, right? This is not a set of circumstances where, for any reason other than the personal gain or protection of Donald Trump, he should be engaging in this behavior. So you talk about the White House putting out talking points that, as you pointed out, don't quite reflect the tenor of the remarks made at the summit. But what do we expect now? You talk about how that went out, and now we're seeing, especially on the Republican side, candidates scramble. What, what's the fallout? I think it's too early to know the fallout, because like everything else that happens with this administration and with this president, something else happens two days later. And at this point, it's too soon to tell whether this has legs. I would hope that it does. It seems a little bit different than some of these other uh, incidents. But you know, if we look at the immediate reaction, John McCain's statement, um, comments on the part of Brennan and other heads of intelligence over time, suggesting that this is the most um, unfitting behavior an American president has ever engaged in, you had a lot of Republicans stay silent. And then today, you've also had Republicans start defending the president. Rand Paul basically came out in support of him. Paul Ryan stopped short of in any way condemning him, simply saying that we know Russia interfered with the election. And so if the Republicans don't find this a sufficient grounds by which to start condemning this administration, it's hard to know whether their base is actually going to in any way move from Donald Trump. Uh, and if they don't, then I think that creates fewer incentives for the Republicans to hold him accountable. Again, the stakes here seem a lot higher. And the fact that he officially declared war on the media suggests that reporter stakes are higher as well. But, you know, I feel like we've been in very similar circumstances before and they've sort of faded away. So appreciate taking your time to pick your brain on the national side of things. Would love to catch you tacking back here locally as we're in the gubernatorial cycle. We have Democratic hopeful Matt Brown coming into the studio this afternoon, and it's been a couple of weeks since we've talked to Jennifer, and even before the show, we said, circumstances have changed here. I'm sure you've been keeping an eye on what's happened with the endorsement process within the Democratic Party, issues that the governor has faced pertaining, especially even to the SEC with the pay-to-play scheme that was involving Oak Tree, that was, uh, her name was uh, involved with, that she returned a donation, but did not, in fact, uh, alert SEC or the state here at that time. So talk with us about where we are in July, heading towards a primary with Matt Brown looking like he's surging. Yeah, I think Matt Brown should be much happier today than he was a month ago or two months ago or six months ago. Um, obviously, taking on an incumbent is very, very difficult. Taking on a relatively popular one in a state that has had a history of sometimes turning a blind eye to this kind of corruption is also tricky. That I mean, said, relatively he, popular. Let's just say that she's never, she doesn't really move beyond that 40% threshold. <laughs> fair point, fair point. Um, except keep in mind, Donald Trump is very similar, right? And it's, it seems like that might be the magic number. Um, but what I will say is that the electoral environment is one in which people behaving badly, people trying to screw over the little people, people lying and manipulating is something that the American people are beginning to push back against, especially in Democratic primaries and especially in cases where they think that they can substitute somebody that might have questionable morals or ethics or judgment under certain circumstances with somebody else. Now, I don't know what the polling on Raimondo's, um, you know, sort of personality traits are. Um, and overall approval rating is tricky because it has so many different components. But, you know, I think that if Matt Brown spends the next couple of months making the case that she has some questionable judgment, and this is a time where, certainly on the Democratic side of the aisle, we can't succumb to that because look at what's happening on the Republican side. It's an argument that could ultimately have traction. 
And let's talk a little bit about the money game. Obviously, the war chest of the governor is formidable. I just had a discussion last week with former Congressman Bob Wigand, who he took the position that, look, she's got so much money, she's just going to be bombarding uh, uh, media buys with her ads. Um, you know, can he overcome the money game? Well, you know, I would say two things. The first is Rhode Island's a one-media market state, right? So it costs a lot less money to run and to be on broadcast TV and to have targeted cable in Rhode Island than it does in many, many other states. So right off the bat, what it costs to win is less. That doesn't mean that having a financial advantage doesn't matter or isn't helpful. But ultimately, what Matt Brown needs to do is make sure that he can run the kind of campaign that he wants to be able to run that he thinks can be effective, regardless of how much money she has. The well, second thing is, in 2006, he raised a ton of money from donors throughout the country who, if he's any kind of politician, he's maintained a lot of these relationships with. And as he hits the final stretch and as he can show in public opinion polls and in surveys, whether they be internal or conducted outside, that he's surging, that's a good way to potentially tap some of these national connections. Now, primaries are hard. A lot of donors don't want to get involved in them. But he had raised most of his money 10 years ago, 12 years ago, also in a primary. So, you know, I don't think he's a typical candidate in terms of facing some of those obstacles. So he's going to be in here shortly, Jennifer. He's going to be talking about his jobs and economy plan. Now, everyone knows he's running fairly to significantly to the left of the governor. If Matt Brown were to emerge from the primary facing a Republican independent challengers, you know, how does someone that left stack up here in Rhode Island if he doesn't tap back to the middle? Well, it's tricky because there's there, there are competing dynamics, right? The first set of dynamics have to do with economic policy and the, the fact that Rhode Islanders have traditionally been okay with Republican governors when it comes to finances. Um, but then on the other side of that, there are a lot of social policies and an increasingly socially progressive electorate in Rhode Island that wants to make sure that a governor, especially as abortion rights and potentially other social policy issues come back to the states will protect a woman's right to choose and do everything else, right? So, um, you know, I think that it's going to be a matter of demonstrating that on the economic front, he's solid, uh, but on the social policy front, there's no question that he's the best choice. Well, we're going to continue to keep a close eye here in the gubernatorial race, of course, all the talk, Trump and Putin. Uh, Jennifer, I appreciate your taking the time to Skype in today. Take My pleasure. Care, take care down there, okay? Jennifer Lawless, American University, moving to UVA, professor of politics there this fall. Appreciate, as always, taking her time to Skype in with us to talk politics. We'll be right back to talk local business here in the state. Don't go anywhere.